Okay, thanks, I count it an honor and indeed a privilege to be with you here this evening and to share with you in this opening session of your conference. And our desires and prayers at Hallam Chapel are that the Lord may richly bless you and indeed answer the longings of all our hearts, that he may come down and revive his work. Four men stood in the shadows of a street in the north of London, and they listened. And the steps of a man approaching could be heard distinctly as he came along the cobble street. As he came abreast of them, they pounced upon him, they took away all his possessions and his money, and they fled. When the poor man got back his breath again and continued his walk to Hackney, he had time to reflect upon the incident. And his first reaction was that he ought to thank God for his mercies to him, in that all down many years he'd never been attacked before. And then he went on to muse about the awful state of man who could jeopardize his life and his soul for less than half a crown. He went on to think about the terrifying grip that Satan has upon the unregenerate. And then his mind turned to worldly wealth and how quickly and suddenly one can be stripped of it and therefore how loosely one should hold on to it. The date was the 8th of March, 1713, in the evening. And the victim was the Reverend Matthew Henry. He'd been uh, preaching in London and was making his way home to Hackney. He'd expounded that evening from the 89th Psalm, from which we read earlier uh, in our service. It was a 16th verse. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. And my dear friends, a man who can react to mugging in the way that Matthew Henry reacted to it, surely is a man that deserves our attention. And we're going to look at him, uh, albeit briefly, uh, this evening. The year 1662 was uh, a difficult and a trying year for Philip Henry and his wife Catherine, through the act of uniformity, along with 2,000 other Puritan ministers, he had been rejected, ejected from his living, which was at Worthenbury, and he removed to a farmhouse by the name of Broadoak in Flintshire. It was exactly five miles and sixty yards from where he'd been living. Because remember, the Five Mile Act was in operation at that particular time. And within a fortnight of their removing to Broad Oak, God gave them great joy in the birth of a little one, a premature baby, who was born on the 18th of October, 1662. During his infancy, he was a, a very delicate child, and indeed he almost died of measles, which killed his brother in the same year. But early in life, he revealed a real brilliance, a brilliance that he'd obviously inherited from both father and mother. At the age of three, we read, he could read in the Bible with distinctness and observation. My dear friends, I wish I had children in my congregation like that. He was initiated in his grammatical studies by a Mr. Turner who at that time was living at Broad Oak, but interestingly enough, he later became vicar of Walberton in this county of Sussex. Now, young Matthew was a, a very keen student. Indeed, he was so keen that his mother oftentimes had to go to him, fetch him from his studies, and chase him out into the fields that he might have some sort of exercise. Of course, his upbringing was in a godly home pious parents, a father who expounded scripture in the home every morning and every evening, 
and he lived under the holy influence of both his father and his mother. When he was at the age of nine, his father happened to be away in London, and he wrote a letter to him. And the letter contained this statement. Every day since you went, I have done my lessons, a side of Latin or Latin verses, and two verses on the Greek Testament. I hope I have done all well, and so I will continue till you come. Boy of nine. But that isn't the interesting thing. That merely showed his academic abilities. He went on, having referred to some relative who had been sick, and he said, By this providence we may see that sin is the worst of evils, for sickness came with sin. Christ is the chief good, therefore let us love him. Sin is the worst of evils, therefore let us hate that with a perfect hatred. A boy of nine obviously with some sort of spiritual understanding, God-given, of these great and wonderful truths. When he was ten, he almost died of fever. But he looks back upon that particular time of his life as the day when God wrought a saving work within his soul. And he refers to it three years later when he's thirteen, when he wrote a catalogue of mercies. It was a count, really, of the progress of religion in his own soul. Having thanked God for spiritual mercies, for Christ and all that Christ is and all that Christ had done, he went on and he said, Lord Jesus, I bless thee for thy word, for good parents, for good education, that I was taken into covenant betimes in baptism, and Lord, I give thee thanks that I am thine and will be thine. Oh, and if we thank God for our parents, godly parents, what greater heritage, what greater blessing, dear young people, than to be brought up in a godly Christian home. We thank God for his education, for he realized that this was something that came from God and was going to be used of God in the days to come. And in this catalogue of mercies he proceeds, I think it was three years ago that I began to be convinced, hearing a sermon by my father on Psalm 51 verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. I think it was that that melted me. Afterwards, I began to inquire after Christ. Dear friends, have we been melted? Have we inquired after Christ? Have we found him? Have we been found of him? This young lad, Matthew Henry, knew this great and glorious work of the grace of God within his soul. He goes on to speak of a sermon that at this time his father preached, and he laid open in that sermon uh, some of the signs of grace within the heart of a believer. And Matthew looked at that sermon, and he applied it to his own heart, and he went and he talked with his father, and told him how he could see, humbly he could see within his own life and experience, some of these marks of grace. He was a, a spiritual young man. And he loved, at this early age, he loved the Word of God. And he loved to hear the Word of God preached, not only by his father, whom he held in the highest respect. You can see that from reading his biography in the first part of this book. He loved to hear all preaching, all true exposition. And in that home, every Saturday afternoon, uh, Philip Henry made his children gather together for an hour to prepare themselves for the coming Lord's Day. And Matthew presided over this little meeting, himself and his sisters. And he revealed an obvious delight for spiritual things, showed an inclination for the Christian ministry by an eagerness to read the Scriptures. It wasn't something that he had to do. 
It was something he longed to do. There was this great desire within his heart at this early age of 13 to read the word of God. He had a great attachment to ministers. And that was interesting to me. He was a boy who somehow was attracted to men whose calling it was to handle the word of truth. And he longed to be with them and to learn of them. He had pleasure, we read, in writing out and repeating sermons. Not only uh, did he listen to them, but he sought to let them sink into his mind. And uh, he wrote them. Indeed, it was his father who encouraged all young people to do this, to write out by memory. And uh, Matthew had folios of these sermons that he had remembered, and in this way he had written out. And on the Saturday afternoon, he used to imitate preaching, not in the way that so often children do, but with a, an understanding and with some sort of God-given inspiration. Indeed, some fear that he was too forward. But his father, Philip, said, let him go on. He fears God and designed well, and I hope God will keep him and bless him. And he did. Whilst his father Philip had been educated at Oxford, he had become rather disillusioned with the universities, and so he made arrangements for his son Matthew to receive tuition from a Mr. Doolittle, a holy, faithful minister, a man who had a congregation in Islington, which is now in the north of London. Uh, he went there, and in 1680... After his arrival, he wrote to one of his sisters to describe the building in which this man, Mr. Doolittle, ministered. And he was obviously captivated by the, the size of it. He said there were several galleries, all pewed. A brave pulpit. Now, I don't know what he meant, but I like that. A brave pulpit. I trust it's a brave pulpit at Halland. It is at Cookfield. Uh, a brave pulpit, he said. A great height above the people. And he's obviously taken with this. Shortly afterwards, unfortunately, persecution came upon Mr. Doolittle, and he had to leave Islington. His uh, uh, students were scattered, and Matthew returned again to Broadoak, where he continued his studies under the direction of his father. And there he grew in grace, and he also grew in intellectual attainments and knowledge. And on his 20th birthday, uh, he wrote, Mercies Received. And you'll note this through the whole of his life, that on his birthdays, he especially stopped and he reflected and he looked back. And in these Mercies Received, uh, there are 26 items. Now, I don't intend to uh, read all of them to you, but I'd just like to give you a little uh, flavor of what he says in these various items. One, that I am endued with a rational, immortal soul, capable of serving God here and enjoying him hereafter, and was not made as the beast that perish. Would you have thought to start like that? He did. That I have had and still have comfort more than ordinary in relation, that I am blessed with such parents as few have, and sisters also that I have reason to rejoice in. I wonder how many lads here could write like that. That I have had a liberal education, having a capacity for and been bred up to the knowledge of the languages, arts and sciences, and that through God's blessing on my studies I have made some progress therein. Listen to this. That I have been endued with a good measure of praying gift, being enabled to express my mind to God in prayer, in words of my own, not only alone, but as the mouth of others. You covet that gift of being able to pray as Matthew Henry did. That I have a good hope through grace that being chosen of God from eternity I was in the fullness of time called, and that good work begun in me, which I trust God 
will perform. And then the 26th one of these items. Lastly, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ, the fountain and foundation of all my mercies. Amen. Hallelujah. And somehow this response is enough within our own hearts. Shortly after this, on the advice of a friend of his father, he went back to London to take up the study of law. And he went to Holborn Court in Gray's Inn. And, of course, during this period, he set his mind to these studies. He had opportunities of hearing great preachers, great preaching in London. And he himself had quite a ministry amongst some of his fellow students. And in the midst of it all, he was also able to fit in a study of French. After three months, and only three afternoons of two hours each per week, he obtained so much insight into the French as with a little help from a dictionary to read with understanding anything in the language. And his diary goes on to say that he dismissed his tutor. He had a great gift, this man, for languages. He was conversant in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin and apparently in the French as well. Well, he returned to Broad Oak in June 1686, and uh, he was immediately invited to preach by Mr. Illidge at Nantwich. And he went there, and for a number of evenings he proclaimed the word of God. And on the last one of those evenings he preached from Job 37, verse 22, with God is terrible majesty. One of the ministers here, have you ever preached from this verse of scripture? With God there is terrible majesty. And in the congregation, uh, there was a notorious gentleman, a very wicked man who was present. And Mr. Reddick went to see him the next morning and found him in tears, and his wife was in tears. And the man obviously had been wrought upon by the Spirit of God. Something of the awfulness of sin and the depravity of his own heart had come over him. And Mr. Illidge spoke with him, prayed with him, and there seemed to be a real work in this man's heart taught his wife to read, uh, set up uh, an altar in the home, became uh, one who went to the Lord's table, and indeed accompanied Mr. Village on a number of occasions when he went out to preach. And for several years he ran well. But later something hindered him, and he became guilty of some sad defection, and finally quitted the narrow way altogether. But the first reaction of this to Matthew Henry, of course, was one of, of great gladness and encouragement. God had used him, and God had blessed his ministry. But reflecting upon it later, and realizing that this man who seemed to have every evidence of being a true believer, and finally falling away, he was ever cautious about the marks of personal religion. He went on to say this, a hypocrite is one who goes with credibility to hell, unsuspected, one who seems religious, and that is all. And this experience obviously made him think very much about the whole question of apostasy. And he asks the question and he, he seeks to answer it. What is the reason of the apostasy of so many who begin well? This was his answer. They never had the law in their hearts. They never acted from a principle. A man may not only have the shape of a Christian, but he may have it drawn so much to the life as that it may pass for a living Christian. There may be some kind of breath and motion and sense and yet he that knows our works may say, Thou art dead. The scale in such a case hangs in a manner even, but sin and lust at last preponderate. Hypocrisy is the way to apostasy, and apostasy is the great proof of hypocrisy. What a solemn warning that came to this man as he meditated and thought, of the experience of this one who apparently had been so wrought upon by his preaching 
at the very beginning. By this time, he was determined in his own heart and mind to enter the ministry. He was invited to preach at Chester by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Henthorne, who was a sugar baker. And uh, the people there pressed him to become their pastor. After a period of three months in London, uh, he began to prepare himself for ordination. He sought counsel of other ministers, ministering friends. And then he sketched a discourse for his own benefit on 1 Timothy 4 verse 15. Meditate on these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. And he stated in his thinking about this the nature and the various parts of, of the ministerial work and what it really means to give oneself wholly to it. He was a man who wasn't going into the ministry in a light-hearted sort of fashion. He realized something of the burden of the Lord was upon him, and he sought to prepare himself for it. And indeed, in addition to this, he composed a paper which he speaks of as a serious self-examination before ordination, in which he asks six questions. And uh, I advise you to get this book and to read these and to study these six questions which he asks himself. And the first is, what am I? This is a needful question, because in ordination I give up myself to God in a peculiar manner. And will God accept the torn and the blind and the lame? Surely no. The sacrifice must be searched before it was offered, that it might be sure to fit its end. And he goes on at some length to open this up to his own heart. Question two, what have I done? This is also a needful question, that searching and examining what have been amiss, I may repent of it, and make even reckonings in the blood of Christ, that I may not come loaded with old guilt to put, an, to put on a new character, especially such a character as this. Question three, from what principles do I act in this undertaking? This is also a very material inquiry in every direction, to ask whence it comes, especially in so great a turn of life as this. And he goes on to show under a number of heads here uh, what the principles really were behind his undertaking this solemn and amazing task. Question four. What are the ends that I aim at in this great undertaking? It is a common saying that the end specifies the action, and therefore it is of great consequence to fix that right, that the eye may be single, for otherwise it is an evil eye. A by and base end will certainly spoil the acceptableness of the best actions that can be performed. And then finally, in question five, he goes on, What do I want? What special things am I now to desire of God the God of all grace. When I know whither to go for supplies, I am concerned to inquire what my necessities are. The requests I have put to God are such as these. And he goes on and to reveal what he had longed for and asked God to give him as he called him into this great and wonderful task. And then question six. What are my purposes and resolutions for the future? This is also a requisite inquiry. When I am to put on a new character and one so honorable. What shall I do that I may walk worthy of the vocation wherewith I am called? And he searches his own heart and he looks into all that he realizes is requisite of him as he faces this great and wonderful calling. And finally he applied for ordination to some of his gifted and learned Presbyterian friends in London. And on the 9th of May, 1687, after due examination, which included a thesis in Latin on the question, Are men justified by faith without the works of the law? After doing that, and a full confession of his faith, he was solemnly 
but privately, ordained by the imposition of hands with fasting and prayer. He realized something of the burden and the weight of responsibility that rested upon him as one who had been called of God to the work of the gospel. He returned to Bordeaux and was met by deputation from the congregation at Chester and on the 2nd of June 1687 he commenced his ministry and he preached to so many other uh, ministers at the beginning of their uh, work for God have preached on 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2 I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified and what he determined that day he went on throughout the rest of his life he knew nothing else Christ was his life his whole life revolved around the very person of his saviour the congregation had increased even before he went to Chester and they had soon to meet in a large meeting house that was part of the outbuildings of the friary they belonged to the sugar baker uh, whom I've mentioned previously it wasn't all that long before uh, the meeting house had to be built in Crook Lane in 1699 and for your interest the cost was 532 pounds 16 shillings and one penny and uh, eight years later they added a gallery for another 85 pounds and five pence unfortunately the meeting house in Crook Lane has been demolished uh, fairly recently and you can't go there and see it anymore but he soon made many friends in Chester and among them the members of a family by the name of Hardware the man was termed an old Puritan and uh, he he had a daughter Catherine both beautiful and pious what could a man desire more than that Matthew had heard of her whilst he was in London she had heard of him through his sisters and he approached the father and her brothers and they were very happy about his interest in her but Mrs. Hardware thought differently. She had high hopes for her daughter. She felt that someone of a, a higher uh, station was meant to be her son-in-law. She had a great regard for Matthew Henry as pastor and friend. But somehow a non-conformist minister in those days had a hard lot. And she wondered whether her daughter would ever have the faith to be able to go through life with him. And so she opposed it. But finally... By the grace of God she gave in and indeed afterwards she had to confess that her prejudices had really been in terms of, of covetousness, covetousness and pride. But they were married, Matthew and Catherine, on uh, a date in August 1687. It was a very happy marriage, but it ended almost as suddenly as it had begun for his wife died of smallpox just before the confinement of their first child on the 12th of February 1689 he died at the age of 25 and the reaction of this sorrowful godly young minister was this I know nothing that could support me under such a loss as this but the good hope that she is gone to heaven and that in a little time I shall follow her thither. The firstborn child was spared. He named her Catherine. He was baptized by his father and at the service on the uh, day or two later he was able to say this. Although my house be not now so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. And this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make me not to grow. And according to the tenor of this covenant, I offer up this my child to the great God, a plant out of a dry ground, desiring it may be implanted into Christ. I'm sorry, I've confused the baptism of this child with the death which took place very shortly afterwards. But this is how he was able to react to these terrible things, apparently, that come into the lives of the most godly 
of men. His mother-in-law felt that it was necessary that a second marriage should be arranged for him, and she recommended a friend, Mary Warburton, to whom he was married in July 1690. God gave them a daughter, Elizabeth, and it was of this little daughter, two years later, that he was able to say that most moving word at the burial of this little girl. And we read that the whole congregation broke down into tears. But he was also able to say this. There is now a pretty little garment laid up in the wardrobe of the grave to be worn again at the resurrection. I love that, don't you? There is now a pretty little garment laid up in the wardrobe of the grave to be worn again at the resurrection. A further daughter, Mary, was born in April 1693, but in less than three weeks she had died also. The Lord is righteous, he said. He takes and gives and gives and takes away. I desire to submit, but, O oh Lord, show me wherefore thou contendest with me. What grace God gave to this man in these and in uh, the death of his father and two of his sisters, which followed hard on the heels of this grief which he had thereby known. He was a godly man. He was a, a spiritual man. And such godliness and spirituality were reflected in his ministry and in his preaching. On the Lord's Day, in his congregation, worship began at 9 a.m. with the singing of the 100th Psalm followed by a few minutes of prayer. Then he read and expounded the Old Testament, beginning at the first chapter of Genesis and going on in a systematic way right through the Scripture. They sang another psalm. There was then 30 minutes of intercession. A sermon of one hour, followed by prayer. They then sang the 117th psalm, and he pronounced the benediction. And uh, this order of service was repeated again in the afternoon. But there he expounded uh, New Testament scripture. And they ended with the 134th or the 136th Psalm. He was a man who delighted in praise. But his contemporaries say that he was a man who was unrivaled in prayer. In the exercise of public and social prayer, Mr. Henry was almost unrivaled. There was no pompous finery, no abstruse and complex elaboration, no disgusting familiarity, no personal reproofs or compliments, no vain repetitions, no preaching. He prayed, and his style was reverent, humble, simple, and devout. A man who knew God and knew what it was to enter into the presence of God and take others with him as he entered into the holiest of all. While he was at Chester, he explained uh, the whole of Scripture more than once to his congregation. And he spent much time in sermon preparation. He was a man who used great care and much diligence in preparing the word that God had given to him. He wrote it out at considerable length. Eight very full duodecimo pages was the usual format in which he produced his sermons. And he gives the advice later on in his life uh, to ministers. Take heed, he says, of growing remiss in your work. Take pain while you live. Think not that after a while you may relax and go over your old stock. The scripture still affords new things to those who search them. Continue searching. How can you expect God's blessing or, or, your, or your people's observance if you are careless? Be studious not to offer that which costs nothing. Take pains that you may find out acceptable words, that all your performances smell of the lamp. This will engage among you. Feed the ignorant with knowledge, the careless with admonition, the wandering with direction and the mournful with comfort. 
and what he exhorted others to do, he sought to do himself. His style was heart-searching and awakening. He put all his strength and all his ability into it. Indeed, his father on one occasion came to him and said, you, you must preach with less vigor. He was wearing out his very body as he sought to proclaim the word of truth. He varied his subject matter. He was never far from the one great theme of Scripture, Christ himself. The Scriptures, he says, are the circumference of faith, the rounds of which it walks, and every point of which compass it touches. Yet the center of it is Christ. That is the polar star on which it rests. He knew it to be so, and so it is. And may we who have the privilege of being ministers follow in his footsteps as he sought to uphold Christ. He modeled his preaching to a great extent upon his father. But he was also helped by the close friendship of a man, the Reverend F. Talents of Salop, who was a father, as it were, to many young ministers in that particular area. Henry wrote some seven years after his ordination to him, and he said, I reckon when I come to Salop, it is as the old Puritans went to Dedham to fetch fire. And he's referring, of course, to John Rogers, who preached there with such great warmth and uh, such blessing of God upon it. Thank you, he says, for your hints to speak more of election and God's free grace. In his preaching, he sought to reveal human depravity, that salvation is entirely in all of God, to show sin, and then to lead to Calvary, and to press on sinners the obligations to believe. Let me quote again from his diary. And so unanswerably did he press the obligations of sinners to believe as to leave all who remain obstinate and impenitent without excuse. I do not stand here, he would say, to mock you with an uncertainty or to trifle with you about an indifferent thing, but in the name of Christ my Master to make a serious offer to you of life and salvation upon the terms of faith and repentance. He used great plainness of speech and sought to expound scripture. Like Bishop Earl's grave divine, he beat upon the text and not upon the cushion. He wasn't a fugitive preacher. He didn't fly away from the text. Neither did he impose into it truths that were not found there. He opened up the scripture. His advice, advice was this. Take heed of affecting novelties in religion, that you fall into vanities or worse. As for the old way, keep to the faith once delivered to the saints. Keep to the proportion of faith. Take heed to your doctrine, that it jostle not out God's grace, nor man's duty, but take both together. Arminianism makes grace a servant to man's goodness. Antinomianism makes it a servant to man's badness. And so they do. His sermons were eminently practical. Duty and comfort go abreast. Neither are to be neglected. Those who would reap in glory are to sow in duty. Justification is to be tried by sanctification. And this which he lays down here as a principle he worked out in his own preaching. On the Sabbath over a period of 14 years he dwelt upon the great doctrines and formulated a body of divinity. He had 30 lectures and he took over a period of some 20 years the questions of scripture. Just went through from the beginning through to the end taking up the questions that are uh, held up before us and posed in the Holy Word of God. At Chester, the observance of the Lord's Supper was held every first Lord's Day of the month. And it's written of those occasions. The table of the Lord was often to them as the Mount of Transfiguration, where they saw the King in his beauty and beheld the land that was a far off. Christ came to them 
in all his glory, and they, they felt his presence, and they no doubt fell as those disciples did at the feet of the glorified Christ of God. He paid much attention to the young, the rising generation, as he calls them, and he sought to teach them a preference for serious companions, serious books, and a serious ministry. The book of Scripture, he said, is the most serious of all. And then he held up before them Baxter's call and Aileen's alarm. He catechized every Saturday afternoon, but he did so with the understanding that he felt the tremendous responsibility for children that rested upon their own parents. He wasn't doing this as something that uh, let the parents out. It was something extra and above. He had lectures in a local jail for 20 years where the jailer's wife was a, a religious woman and it was only terminated because of the uh, fact that some uh, local curate was really uh, jealous of what he was doing. He preached locally and far afield. And of course all this made him very well known. After a visit to London in 1698, the congregation in Hackney, aided by the Reverend John Howe, that famous man, appealed to Matthew Henry to become their pastor, but he declined. He received a similar request from the congregation at Salter's Hall, and it came as a surprise to him, and his immediate reaction was this, Lord, keep me from pride. How easy it is to be boosted up. These people, those people, they want me. Lord, keep me from the terrible temptation to be proud because of this. Humanly speaking, he would have consented. He liked London. Well, the advantages would have come to his family. Greater area of usefulness. He says, though I think ministers married to their ministry, yet I cannot see any scripture ground to think that they are married to their people. It's interesting, isn't it? Married to the ministry but not necessarily married to the local congregation. He saw no reason, biblically, why he shouldn't leave Chester and go to Hackney. And then he received an invitation from Manchester. His reply, I cannot think of leaving Chester till Chester leave me. That was in June 1705. Three years later, he was invited to a joint pastorate at Old Jewry, but he refused on these grounds because he loved the people at Chester too well to leave them. He had a pastor's heart. It was a love went out from the man to the people, and it was reciprocated by the people to the man. The same year, uh, an invitation came from Silver Street, where John Howe had ministered uh, previously. They invited him? No. But the congregation, without his knowledge, elected him to be pastor jointly with another man the Reverend Rosewell, without uh, any reference to him, he jointly was elected to be their pastor. And of course, all this brought great pressure upon the man. We don't understand these things, most of us who are ministers. All these invitations coming, pressing invitations. And at the end of the year, 1708, in his diary, he records this. Here I am, let the Lord do with me and mine, as seemeth good unto him. That providence, I trust, will so order every event as that nothing shall be an invincible temptation to me to draw me from God and duty in any instance. All he wanted to know was the guidance and the leading of the Spirit of God and do the will of God. But the congregation continued to press him. They sent a letter to an old friend, Mr. Tong, and uh, Matthew Henry replied, desiring them to acquiesce in his purpose to continue at Chester. They were bringing in an audience uh, pressure upon him and almost seeking to force him away from the congregation to which God had called him. And uh, this was a real hindrance to him. Indeed, he got hard censures from people for not acquiescing. He got anonymous letters. One person anonymously wrote and said he would do more mischief in London than he had done in Chester. And one can see how this must have brought great difficulty and trial to him. In 1710, 
He had a further unanimous invitation from the congregation at Hackney, where the successor to the famous Dr. Bates had died. He was a man by the name of Robert Billio. Now, Billio founded the church at Bruffing in Hertfordshire, and he was a man of great zeal. Uh, not only spirit, he was a man of great zeal physically. And Billio never walked. Billy always ran. Round his congregation, when he went out on pastoral visits, he ran. And it was from this man, this Puritan, that we get the, the phrase, he ran like Billio. And it was Billio uh, that uh, was there and had died. Uh, and the invitation came uh, to him again. And they said that they would be as the importunate widow. They wouldn't let him go. Well, Matthew Henry visited them and promised that if they would wait till the spring, and he says in his diary, I hope they won't, he promised that he would come to them uh, for a longer period. Went in May 1711 and stayed there till July and promised to go to them in the following spring. And he pleaded with God to incline his heart the way for his glory. And he recalls the reasons uh, for going to Hackney. It's lawful for a minister to leave. The invitation was unanimous, pressing and importunate. He was happy with the congregation over the trial period. Uh, there were various evidences of God's providence in it. Great opportunities in London. By this time he wasn't in the best of health and would have been confined within the walls of Chester. And uh, great help would be given to him, he felt, there in the continuation of his commentary upon which he was working. He continued to pray, to seek the advice of ministers. He hoped that blessing would come to Hackney if he went. He hoped that greater blessing would come to Chester if he left, through the ministry of another man. For he says, though the people at Chester were loving, and many valued his ministry, which had extended now for twenty-five years, many had left, and very few had been added. Now, to a carnal man, to someone who was not the spiritual man that Matthew Henry was, this would have been the thing that would have forced him out and said, yes, I, I must go to Hackney. This was one of the things that, that kept him back, in a sense. And he realized something of the, the awfulness of not seeing his ministry being blessed. At the end of 1711, he wrote, I have upon my knees in secret Acknowledge to the Lord that I am in distress, in a great strait. I cannot get clear from Chester, or if I could, cannot persuade myself cheerfully to go. I cannot get clear from Hackney, or if I could, I cannot persuade Oxorem Miam cheerfully to stay. But finally, uh, he, he left Chester and commenced at Hackney on the 18th of May, 1712. And there was then a communicant membership there of a hundred people. He was now fifty. And half his life had been spent in the ministry. To which he had exerted all his spiritual vigor. And all his intellectual attainments. And during those years he did allow some of his works to go into print. At the age of twenty-eight he had written a brief inquiry into the nature of schism. 1692, he had given the world the account of his father, the life and death of Mr. Philip Henry, a monumental work of which Dr. Chalmers could say one of the most precious religious biographies in our language. Read it, my dear friends, and follow on by reading Matthew Henry as well. 1702, he produced and had printed a scripture catechism then a plain catechism for children. Very many sermons and pamphlets came from his pen. One of them, the sober-mindedness pressed upon young people in discourses on Titus 2.6, with a great concern for the young of his day. But the greatest work, and the work by which he is perhaps best known and remembered, is his exposition of the Old and the New Testament. It was commenced in 1704, although four years later he sent manuscripts to one of his friends to peruse and if he thought fit to have them printed. They were never printed then. Maybe the printers themselves weren't prepared to take on the task. But it was started in 1704 
renewed with zeal, he says. And it was first announced as a sort of advertisement at the end of a sermon that he preached on the death of a brother minister. There is now in the press and will shortly be published an exposition with practical observations on the five books of Moses by the same author. I'm not sure that I have time to quote very much from what he says about uh, this great work that took so much of his life. Let me just give you one or two points from his work here. Volume 1, 1704, November 12. This night, after many thoughts of heart and many prayers concerning it, I began my notes on the Old Testament. It is not likely I should live to finish it, or if I should, that it should be of public service. For I am not par negotio, yet in the strength of God, and I hope with a single eye to his glory, I set about it, that I may endeavor something and spend my time to some good purpose. Let the Lord make what use he pleaseth of it. I go about it with fear and trembling, lest I exercise myself in things too high for me. The Lord help me to set about it with great humility. And the last entry in his diary concerning the great exposition is of real interest. 1714, April 17, finished Acts, and with it the fifth volume. Blessed be God that has helped me and spared me. All praise be to God. April 19, reviewed some sheets of the Acts. April 21, began the preface, but did little in it. 23 and 24, studied the preface and went on with it. He completed it only to the end of the Acts of the Apostles. He went to Hackney at the age of 50, and almost immediately his health began to deteriorate. He was stricken down with diabetes, and frequent attacks of what he terms the stone. And in May 1714 he set out again for Chester, and on one of the Sabbaths he preached on Hebrews 4.9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And the next Sabbath, the last two Sabbaths that he was here upon earth, he preached, and from the same chapter in the first verse, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left as of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. 21st of June, he commenced his journey back to Hackney. Fell off his horse at one place, although he claimed that he wasn't hurt, and he went on to Nantwich, and he preached there from Jeremiah 31, verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastened me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the youth. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. And they said there was some absence of his usual liveliness. Went to his bed, and at about five o'clock the next morning, the 22nd of June, 1714, at the age of 52, he was seized with an apoplexy, and after laying three hours speechless with his eyes fixed, he fell asleep. He was buried in Trinity Church in Chester. In closing, I feel I can do nothing better than quote from the great George Whitfield, who was trained as a Christian and trained as a preacher by Matthew Henry's commentary, which he studied on his knees and went through at least four times and who, to the close of his life, spoke of its author with profound veneration, ever calling him the great Mr. Henry. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com.
www.ghostbusters.com by phone at 780-450-3730 by fax at 780-468-1096 or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.